pretty good, a little groggy. Woke up a few hours ago, those x-rays took it out of me, but... Word, word. Not bad. Right on. So, did you have something in particular you wanted to talk about or something? Um... Mostly the ethics of animal product consumption from the standpoint of animal versus human sentience. And then we can talk about nutrition, but I don't have any notes and I'm not like a doctor or anything. Yeah, so, sure. I don't have any medical qualifications either. Oh, cool. How long have you been vegan? Uh, about seven years. That's impressive. I, I was a vegan for about a year and a half. Um, True. Doing it smart, I believe at least. What does your uh, what's your like top seven foods you usually eat? Would you say? Mm, I don't know. I eat like mock meats, and uh, I eat a mix of like processed and whole foods. So I'll have like rice, um, whole grains, uh, and then like vegan mock meats. I eat tofu a lot. Um, I don't know pastas and noodles and stuff. That's pretty simple. Yeah, when I was eating vegan, it was a lot of tofu, um, black beans. Yeah, black beans are some fire. homemade seitan. Oh, right on. No. Um, beans and rice combo and like a stir fry, that sort of thing. Oh, soy milk, mock meats as well, peanut butter. Oh yeah, I, lo I love plant milks. <laughs> they they do actually taste really good. No milk, I'm kind of, I don't know, after reading their ingredients, not too sure about oat milk, but... Mm -hmm. What kind of ingredient kind do, you do you drink? take issue with? Oh, I, I like the soy oat milk the best. Or, I mean, not soy, sorry, silk oat milk. <laughs> oh, silk milk, yeah. Yeah, I like the extra... Um, the ingredient... You like the, what was it? Oh, I was just saying the extra creamy one, that one's super fire. Nice. Uh, the ingredients that concern me in oat milk is the, um, like it's got maltodextrin in there. It's got, I forgot what the type of sugar is called, but a really high glycemic index sugar because it's absorbed so quickly. That's like made in the um, production process, and so they don't have to list added sugars. Are and you, then are you seed like oils, which are pretty on the fats on. Oh, you, What's up? you're in the anti-seed oil camp. Not necessarily. Um, I've just heard about it, and I'm very not not passionately passionately leaning towards maybe they're not that great for you just because um, the nature of canola oil, what plant it's derived from, and the fact that human beings... Like, this is definitely the first time in history that we've eaten seed oils because it takes so many seeds to this level of seed oil, anyways. Yeah, it sounds like you've been listening so to Paul Saladino. Um, no, mostly I do listen to one carnivore YouTuber, Bart K. I think he's interesting mad scientist <laughs> i guess that's like, way you, one way to put it yeah interesting <laughs> hey i'm sure you don't like them but um yeah so nu nutrition is a fun topic because i'm really interested in fitness and whatnot but yeah, my totally. decision to believe that my eating habits are ethically okay is mostly based on how we view animal sentience nowadays. What do you mean? So by that? I, I assume you. Like, so I assume you've heard the term sentience scale and all that. Yeah, I I I don't really like. I my view is kind of unorthodox with respect to um, the whole idea of a sentience scale. I mean, I take sentience to be the property of having a subjective experience, and so being that. Right, right it's either either is or is not occurring and so 
it's not really a scale on my view, but I understand what people are trying to say. They're trying to say that like there's different qualities and different properties that the experience of sentience might have, right? And so and those can vary. And I think that's what people are trying to say when they're saying that there's a uh, like a uh, sentience scale or whatever. Okay. I, I do believe there's a magnitude aspect to it. Like, um, sure. I would say that there's a lot more suffering and just intensity in that moment of a person's sentience when they're having a really good time or going through some type of trauma compared to they're sleepy and they stub their toe. Like, the magnitude of personal subjective experience is amplified. Yeah, true. And so, it's a pretty much unanswerable question, at least for now, in our world. Of What question? What physical property, the question of um, how to actually substantiate sentience in an objective way. Because we don't have, like, a part of the brain or a collection of parts of the brain that we can point to and be like, oh, yeah, these 100% create sentience as long as they're structured this way and that way. So how I look at sentience is more so emergent properties of sentience, which I believe to be a, an experience of self-reflection, which is only born out of self-awareness. And an emergent property of that in humans, for example, is language creation. And um, as far as I know, there's no animal that can actually learn human language. Human language involves an awareness. I don't mean to shock and if you want to take it one point at a time, let me know, but I can just lay it out. No, go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll talk after you're done. Okay. So in human language, there's an awareness, an acknowledgement of time, self, things that are not the self, internal, external, the experience of emotions, uh, all of these things that they're literally emergent properties of sentience because those concepts couldn't have developed and then been used without an awareness of them and no animal Wait. can actually learn human language sorry I, i've heard a lot about the coke i don't yeah. i don't i don't mean to be rude but you said that you said it couldn't um what, what like couldn't is a modal term right and so like what modality are you referring to when you're uh, saying that it couldn't happen, is that are you saying like a logical modality or like a physical modality? Um. Uh, well, the root cause that would allow the learning of human language would be physical. But I just mean um. Like, like as far as I know, I've heard a lot about like Coco the gorilla, or people talk about animals own methods of communications within their species wait so when you when you but, when you were using the word couldn't you were using it on a physical modality is that correct i suppose uh, i just don't think anim non-human animals can actually learn human language to a degree where they're like like there's coco the gorilla like Okay, it's signed for orange because it wanted an orange. That that could be explained without awareness because um, like you can teach a dog to shake. It's a command-based thing, and then the orange signing. It's that doesn't take any awareness of self, or the orange, or time, or emotions, or anything like that. It's just a multi-step command, and Coco the gorilla never got further than that. And I've never seen an example of an animal actually learning human language. And I don't think it's necessarily possible because they lack the um, sentience that the concepts in language right. so, so, are emergent. So possible, again, is a modal term. And I'm just assuming you're still referring to physical possibility, correct? Could you define modal? Yeah, modal. Or just put it in like. 
sure. Like, modal is essentially a way that we understand, like, um, connections between, like, uh, how do I explain this? Like, so essentially, like, if you're using a term like can't or requires or, like, possible, like, like, they, they, like, something can only be possible or something can, like, can only be, um, like, required on a certain modality so like to give you an example like if i was saying this is not possible on a logical modality that would mean that there's some law of logic or there is some um some constant that we that we accept in logic that's being violated um in the instance of this occurring right and so uh in a physical modality if we're talking about a physical modality then there would be some like physical law or constant which is being violated and so if something, so for example, uh, so does, sorry, does that make sense so far at least? Yeah, so here we go. Yeah, so, so like if something's impossible, right, like it has to be on a given modality. And so like, for example, like I could say that like on a certain, uh, maybe a video game modality of a certain kind, right, that it's impossible to perform a certain action or something like that. And that's just like basically saying within the constraints of this modality of the video game, right? It that it cannot, it, it is unable to, um, get, uh, what's a good way to put this? It's it's unable to essentially occur because it's violating some sort of rule or law or something that goes along with that, right? The most common modalities people refer right. to are physical and logical. That's why I go to those first. Sorry, I'm I'm on a walk right now. <laughs> no, you're good. No worries. So my question to you, if 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 in fact what you're saying is that on a physical modality it's impossible for an animal to learn human language, then my question would be like, what physical law or constant is being violated, uh, given that an animal like it like the proposition an animal has learned uh, human language. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just correct within the available observations. Like, if you can provide an example of an animal learning human language, then that would change a lot of things. And, but, um, but you were saying it's not possible, right? And so the, the burden would be on you to demonstrate, like, how that's not p physically possible. Like, there must be some sort of physical law or constant that's being violated. So, for example, like, uh, I, ca I can't... Sorry? I, I don't think that's necessarily true that I have the burden of proof here because basically what I'm saying well, well, is if, you make... if there were two types of frogs, right, and one of those types of frogs has been observed jumping only two feet and the other one four feet, why would the burden of proof be on me if I'm claiming, oh, well, the first type of frog can't jump two feet when there are no valid examples of it doing so well that's like the person can jump more than two feet would have to provide proof because they're making a positive claim about the animal's abilities well when you make a claim positive or negative the burden of proof is on you so if you're claiming for example like this is impossible like you would have to demonstrate that impossibility does that make sense oh uh, i i think it's demonstrated in the fact that it's never happened. Uh, but that, but that's not an example of a physical law or a physical constant that's being violated, right? And so it, it, if you can't identify a physical law or a physical constant that's being violated, then I don't see why we wouldn't accept that it's physically possible. People have tried to do it, and it's never been done, teaching an animal human language. Yeah, but that's compatible with it being physically possible, right? How is it compatible that it's never successfully been done? Because there's no physical law or constant being broken by that proposition being true. Well, uh, it, yeah, this is kind of... Eh, this is a little semantic heavy because you're asking me to point to a very specific, like, part of the brain or physical law or logical law that says 
Well, it animals can't hurt. hurt yeah, much, it, it, it depends on which yeah. modality you're referring to. If you're trying to say it's a logical modality that it's not possible for an animal to learn human language, then I would just ask you, what's the contradiction between... Uh, how, how, how can you derive a contradiction from the proposition an animal has learned human language? Mm -hmm. Well, I would just need proof of an animal learning human language. Okay. And... But as you're, far as I know, it doesn't exist. Sure. So, like, saying that something, like, if, if, you, like, if you're making a claim about probability or, like, the likelihood, you know, that's, that's another thing entirely than a modal statement, right? So, you know, if, if it's impossible, then there has to be some kind of, um, some kind of rule law or you know something along these lines a constant that's that's being violated right so i'll just give you a really clear example to maybe this will help clear it up right so i would say it's impossible for me on a logical modality to be standing inside and standing outside at the same time right and i can derive the contradiction for you formally if you like okay i hear what you're saying so if i were to adjust my premise there where I said, oh, it's definitely impossible, right? Sure. I would say, okay, it's very improbable, or at least it's improbable, and my personal confidence in its impossibility is very high. Because, I mean, this is almost like asking, okay, well, how do you know there isn't a diamond sitting in that tub of a billion grains of sand. Mm, I don't. Th I don't well, think that's really analogous. Sorry, what were you saying? Well, it's kind of a representation of the fact that nobody's ever documented an animal using human language. People have tried to teach them human language. It's yeah. never happened. It's not reported in any history. Sure. Or science. Yeah, I can get on board with that. So that, and then we can also look at things like art, <clears throat> art because art is a representation of the sentience that humans experience. I, I know less about this one. If there's any examples of animals creating art, like maybe elephants have, or you know they've made symbols or something. I know that they herd around past dead herd members and that sort of thing which I actually wouldn't eat elephants because I believe they're just high enough on my personal view of the sentient scale hmm. but um okay yeah okay so we agree that it's improbable that animals can learn human language um I wouldn't use the word can I would just say um, an animal learning human language is is something that I would consider to be uh, uh, a low likelihood, or rather, I don't expect that it would happen. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So I can give an example of my personal view of the sentient scale now. So personally. Due to the fact that I believe there is a clear distinction, probably, between um, animal sentience, if there is any, and um, human sentience, that means that I believe one of the most disabled humans, excluding coma, brain death, that sort of thing, is probably orders of magnitude higher on the sentient scale than say a cow or a chicken. Cow is a little bit gray, but chicken definitely in my opinion. Um, so like if a chicken, for example, has sentience, which I think it's likely that it doesn't have any due to the just lack of emergent properties showing it like art or language. Ugh. Sorry, I'm recovering from surgery. Walking is a little tough, but... Oh, you're good, man. Let's see. So I believe if a chicken has any sentience at all, 
than its highest experience of sentience. Wouldn't be like a typical human's experience of it, but more like if somebody ridden with dementia stubbed their toe and then forgot about it and their experience of it like 10 minutes after it happened. So I believe it's either extremely minuscule or just zero. Um, cows, pigs, elephants, um, chimpanzees, it, you know, maybe there's some more argument to be held there. But it, for example, why I'm getting at this is as an ex-vegan myself, I've heard the name the tray argument plenty of times. And usually a disabled human is the example, right? Well, it just depends That's on what you're giving for the traits, right? What was that? Uh, well, the the hypothetical is going to depend on, like, what you chose for the traits, right? I mean, me like, mentally disabled humans is a common, um, is a common hypothetical due to the, like, um... Right. Yeah, people tend to answer very similarly to name the trait. But yeah, since you're already familiar with it, then what are your um, what are your traits then, if you don't mind my asking? So that's why I made the um, distinction. I can provide a list of traits, I suppose, between. But, but that's why I made the distinction between um, human sentience and animal sentience, and the evidence of human sentience being art and language with concepts that require a self-aware mind to reflect on versus animals likely not being capable of that or, if, or of it being unlikely that they could be. So if you're asking me to name one trait, I would say sentience, which isn't conducive to the argument, right? But if you had me propose a list of traits, it would just be that which constitutes a human versus a non-human. So like human genome, um, intelligence, yes, but it's actually not that um, high on my list of like foundational requirements for human conscious experience. Well, um, the okay. use of language, art, that sort of thing. So, are you basically saying that you're 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 doubtful or you're... wouldn't say like oh that bird's more of a dog or something that just innately can't fly if that makes sense. So, she's an outlier within her group. And you were asking me if I believe that she is sentient. I, I believe it's probably just a fairly dim, not to get abstract here, but fairly dim experience. But an experience, but, but an experience nonetheless, right? Well, because are you defining sentience as a subjective experience? Because I mean, we should probably just clear that up now. Because that's that's what I mean when I say sentience. If you mean something totally different, then we're actually talking past each other. Well, no, I agree with you, but um, and okay. my asterisk on that is that sentience requires a mind capable of awareness of certain concepts and reflection. Because wait, uh, like that's you, certain content and reflections required for sentience. Certain um, it, there has to be a mind capable of reflection of what's going on in, in the body for there to be an experience because if we just look at things responding to stimuli and say oh it's responding to stimuli it must be experiencing that stimuli like oh clearly this farm animal is screaming or it's in pain um i don't believe that that's enough to determine that there's actually a mind experiencing the signals going through that body because even bacteria avoid negative stimuli and they don't even have nerves yeah sure but i mean like how do you know for example that other humans are sentient because they can well learning human language and using it as an example 
I mean, but Ray. like, how do you know they're not all philosophical zombies? I just don't know about that. Like, I don't know if something without a mind could, because human language involves, oh, I feel like this, or I understand that I'm separate from that which is external to me, or an understanding of time passing. Like, for example, I don't believe that a lion can be sitting by his den and be thinking, oh, there might be a prey nearby my den tomorrow. I don't believe that that's something animals can do. Is that awareness of time and self and external possibilities based on past experience? I don't believe that there's a reflective mind that is required to enable personal subjective experience in a biological body. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to address what you're saying because you're, you're kind of throwing modal terms left and right here, and I'm still not clear, like, what modality you're referring to. <laughs> well, if I were to ask you, like, because you're making a positive claim, I'm making a negative claim. We both have to defend it. That's fair. Wait, what's my claim? But if I were to ask Oh, well, I assume that animals have um, sentience similar to human beings. I assume. Oh. Uh, I mean, I guess it just depends on what you mean by similar. It's kind of vague, you know. Well, do you think that if an animal gets hurt, there's a reflective mind in the animal saying, oh, I'm hurt, this sucks, and, like comparing it to past experiences of pain. I'm agnostic on that. Okay, you're agnostic on that. What's your own general stance on non-human animal sentience? I, I believe that most animals are sentient. I mean, there's some animals that I'm convinced aren't sentient, like bivalves, for example. Right, right. So do you believe, then, that a central nervous system is fundamental to sentience? Yes, I do. At least as far as we're aware. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, convinced that, like, that's the only option, but, like, to the best of our knowledge, as far as I can tell, that seems to be the case. Right, so do you believe that if something has a central nervous system or a brain at all, that it has some level of sentience. Yeah, if it has a brain and a central nervous system, that would be enough to to sway my doxastic leaning towards the the being in question having sentience. Um, however, uh, I'm not entirely like that's that's not like set in stone. I guess I could say because like for example, like there are insects that'll have a nervous system and a brain, and I'm still not sure whether insects are sentient. I know that's a, a debated topic. Right? So I'm not really convinced of insects, but as far as most animals go, especially domesticated farmed animals, like I am convinced that they are sentient, yeah. What convinces you? Well, the same thing that convinces me that humans are sentient, right? Like they, re they react in the same way that I would expect a sentient being to react. They, um, what's it called? They, uh, they also have the prerequisites, um, that we understand to be um, that which gives rise to sentience or uh, which is you know specifically the central nervous system in the brain all right okay well we don't know if just the presence of a central nervous system shows sentience and that's why I rely on emergent properties but um was I gonna say oh so the fact that farm animals react in ways that a human can relate to, uh, I don't think that that's very good evidence of self-awareness, consciousness, subjective experience, because well, every animate... Do you take all of those to be synonyms? 
Sorry, what was that? So do you take all of those to be synonyms? Because cause I don't. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's a good argument that there's a mind experiencing that stimuli and that reaction of their nervous system. Because, like you said, bivalves, I mean, even they respond to stimuli. Sure. Or even bacteria respond to stimuli that a human can relate to. Absolutely, but... And then if you look at mammals specifically, like... Yeah. Oh, I was gonna say, but like the sorry, I don't, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I, I sometimes I'm just like I like to jump the gun because I'm just I enjoy conversations and stuff. But uh, no, I mean to. Uh, it's all good. I mean, like, feel free to cut me off anytime if you wanna like jump in as well. Like, uh, I, I don't take offense to okay. that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. what was I saying? Oh yeah. Um, I agree. You know, I agree that the, that bacteria and plants they react in ways that we can relate to. However, they do also lack the the pr the prerequisites that we currently understand give rise to sentience, and so that's enough to sway my doxastic leaning. I think that's a very. Uh, I think that's a bit of an overreach to say that we understand that the central nervous system and brain give rise to sentience because if we were to understand that in an actually substantive way we would be like oh well it's the combination of a hypothalamus and this part of the brain and that part of the brain you know we would be able to point to the structure underlying sentience within the central nervous system not just the fact that there is one and then we would have to specifically prove that that structure combination or circuitry produces sentience and a reflective mind. Yeah, I mean, I guess we just have, uh, I, I think I see the separation here with us. Like, uh, I just don't take it to be that um, that we require, or, hang on, let me think about what I was gonna say for a second. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. I guess what I'm good with you sipping on. What's that? <laughs> oh, I've got. I've got uh, a, I just said, what are you sipping on? I got a Pepsi uh, <laughs> mango. That sounds good. Yeah, it's actually pretty fire. I've never seen it. I thought I'd try it out, and uh, I was actually pretty impressed. It's nice. Is that American? I've never seen those in America. Uh, uh yeah, yeah. I'm in America. Cool. I don't know if it's new but, or um, not. Anyways, so like, I think what I was trying to say is that, like, um, I think that y we have different, um, what's, what's a good way to put it? Like, not intensities, but I guess, I guess magnitudes of, of properties that emerge from sentience that would give us enough doxastic leaning to infer sentience, right? <laughs> And so I understand, I understand why you would give moral value to Bree, like being a member of the species that is, you know, like has whatever you say, you know, 99% or what, you know, whatever has um, uh -huh. higher levels of intelligence and more rich experience and more dynamic experience. Um, but I still don't understand why you would consider Bree sentient because it seems like from your criterion that you put or your criteria that you put forward that she wouldn't meet those criteria. And so it's, I mean, again, like I can see why the moral consideration would come into play, but I'm still not getting why you would consider Bree to have sentience, but not, for example, like a farm animal. Okay. That was a good reply. Give me a minute. <laughs> yeah, take your time. Um, let's see. So I think that there's a very much more massive difference between Brie as a being or organism and a farm animal as a being or an organism than there is between a fully functional non-disabled human in Brie. Uh, I believe that the difference, the differences are 
very skewed towards Brie being much, much, much closer to a functional human than she is to a farm animal. Um, and just personally, I mean, I would I would imagine, perhaps, that Bree's experience of sentience, maybe it comes in flashes of self-awareness or something like that. Like, if you have any memories of the baby or toddler and you became self-aware in that moment and then it stopped, do or comparable to a dementia patient. Do you consider self-awareness um, and sentience to be synonymous? Is self-awareness among other um, conceptual awarenesses because I believe that a reflective mind of the self, the exterior, the environment, time, emotions is required for a being to be sentient because otherwise it's just nerve signals shooting through me. Right. <clears throat> and like humans have language in our and expressive mediums because we have a reflective mind of our biological experience. And that's why I consider them really important emergent properties of sentience. Yeah, I mean, I can see where you're coming from, but again, I'm still, I guess, I, maybe you, maybe I just missed it or I'm not understanding you correctly, but I'm still, it's still not clear to me, like, what is driving your consideration that Brie would be sentient? The fact that she is a human, I would assume her sentience is just lower than a typical human's, but it's closer to that than it is to a farm animal. I mean... Because I believe that the observational differences between Brie and a farm animal are still worlds apart from the observational differences between Brie and a functional human. And then she's also an outlier. That sort of thing. Hmm. Uh, like, would you argue that Brie is more similar to a farm animal than she is to a fully functioning, intelligent human? I, I have no idea. It just, it depends on, like, what similarities we're referring to specifically, right? Like, I mean, obviously, morphology is not going to be um, the same, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so, like, I, you know, I do, like, I'm not sure how you would really measure that. Um, you know, maybe stack propositions or something. Just the collection of available traits to observe. But which still goes down the name of the tray rabbit hole, so fortunately I think we're on track from where we started with this example. So I think that the amount of traits that Brie has in common with a fully functioning, obviously, evidently self-reflective, or just generally reflective human being, like, it, it, those traits, the traits that they share are is such a larger pool than the traits that she shares with a farm animal like it could it, I don't know it could be like 10 times the difference to illustrate my visualization of the placements on a sentient scale yeah I mean obviously this I mean this is just an intuition it's really like it's something that's incredibly difficult to empirically analyze <laughs> well right so we have to go off observations and so Unless you think that Brie is more observationally similar to a farm animal than a human, I would just argue that it's more likely that she's sentient than she's not. And even if she wasn't necessarily, you know, like fully sentient all the time or something like that, I don't think that that would suddenly bridge the gap between the vast, vast majority of humans and farm animals. And I don't think that that would imply equal moral considerations or even similar. Right? Sure, well, I mean, that just depends on, like, how you're hashing out your normative framework and whatnot. <laughs> well, do you think Brie is sentient? Yeah, my doxastic leaning is that Brie is sentient. Okay, do you believe that 
You said you're kind of iffy on sentient scales when it comes to orders of magnitude and whatnot or intensity, right? <sighs> no, it's it's just that like I I take sentience to be the property of having a subjective experience. And so this either is or is not occurring. And so in my eyes, a being either is sentient or is not sentient. I don't see there a sliding scale of sentience specifically. And again, like what I think people are referring to when they're talking about scales of sentience is the, the properties of the sentient experience in question, right? The, 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 the different propositions that are true of the um, sentient experience in question. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, my um, question for you is why wouldn't the intensity of sentience increase or decrease based on reflective capability? Because, for example, if a human scrapes their knee, they have a load of memories of pain at different intensities to compare that to. That requires a reflective mind, a self-reflective mind, an understanding of past, present, future, um, a memory of how that felt subjectively. So I think that the reflective process, and in the many forms that it comes in, is absolutely essential for an actual subjective experience. And mm, I'm not convinced of that myself. I don't believe that animals show that. Do, do you, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not convinced of that myself. Do you have an argument for that? How do you mean? Sorry? Entirely convinced of a reflective mind being necessary or very important to sentience? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, for? I mean, I would, I would go with very important unless you want to go down the modality road again. <laughs> I mean, well, this is where it gets, this is where it does get murky, right? But, like, what is subjective experience without um, reflective capabilities? Sure. So, like, if you don't know that you're there, and you don't hold the concept in your mind that you're there and other things are there, you're yourself... Um, time exists, you know, what you're emotionally feeling right now, which is just a scenting abstraction of a lot of things. You have to be able to compare that to other memories and experiences. Like, what is sentience without a reflective mind? Well, what do you, what do you mean by have to? Are it you trying to say that it's logically entailed? I mean, logically, it, like, potentially, but I'm just asking you, because it doesn't make sense to me if something can't reflect on reality in itself or any aspect of the two, then what even is sentience for them? Because I feel like if a human gets hurt, then they know it hurts because they have a catalog of experiences that they've been able to reflect on, did reflect on in the moment, and they're approximating the experiences compared to each other. But if something can't do that, it doesn't really show emergent properties of awareness. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm, so I'm just I'm not thinking. convinced of that, though. Okay, so... I mean, I'm willing to be convinced. Oh, that's, like, that's why I asked you for an argument. Well, you're asking me to point to something concrete and answer the question of the underlying structure of sentience. Uh, I stay agnostic on the underlying structure. That's why I look at emergent properties as evidence. And y your argument is if something has... A brain and central nervous system it's probably sentient yeah and i just don't see 
Well, also, I would, I would, I would, uh, I, just I mean, I would, I would append to that, you know, that the, the being reacts in the way that, you know, we would let, that I would expect a sentient being to react, you know, and this is based on my own subjective experience with, you know, cause I know I'm sentient because I have access to my own experience. Right. And for everyone else, I have to infer that they're sentient because of these properties that I explained, you know, the, the existence of the central nervous system and the brain in conjunction with the behaviors that I would expect from a sentient being. Okay. So behaviors, um, uh, well, what, so you've determined that you believe a CNS is probably required at least. So what's the distinction between a bivalve reacting to stimuli in a way that might be relatable to humans well, and a cow reacting to stimuli? Well, a bivalve, at, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Where's the evidence that there's sentience experiencing those reactions because I just don't see any emergent properties that would make me think that they're sentient. Right. And I think that's where our, the difference in our views lies. Right. Because again, like I believe like in my in understanding that the existence of a central nervous system in conjunction with the brain and the behaviors that we would expect from a sentient being that these all together are enough for me to infer sentience. But, okay, what are but, the behaviors that you would expect from a sentient being? Oh, for example, like avoiding nauseous stimuli, stimuli um, you know, perhaps getting despondent when something um, terrible happens, um, perhaps, you know, experiencing, or perhaps expressing, like, um, sort of playful, like, joyful sort of behaviors that we, you know, it's things like that. Okay, uh, so I don't think that those behaviors are synonymous to an expression of sentience. I don't think they because... are, but I, but it, but for me, it's enough to infer sentience in conjunction with the uh, bio, but uh, the biological, um, the biological systems that we understand, um, or that 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 science at least seems to largely agree, uh, give rise to sentience. Okay, so what do we understand about the biological requirements for sentience? Because as far as I know, that's a largely unanswered question. Yeah, well, and that's why I, it's I don't say they're necessarily required, but as far as we understand, as far as we know, these are the property or these are the properties that give rise to sentience and that's based on a lot of empirical research that i'm not very well versed on as well as uh, what properties? sorry what properties just the so what properties do we currently understand to be um to provide rise to sentience because are you going to argue specific parts of the brain or are you just going to say, well, a, a CNS in a brain? Yeah. Because that's, there's not much to that. I believe that language, human language, art, that sort of thing is a much stronger um, uh, argument because you know, like a person can tell you, oh, I want to go to the store today. I went to the store yesterday and it felt really good. And I'm hoping it feels good again today so that I feel good tomorrow. That if you could show me one example of a non-human animal just saying that or being able to learn how to say that in any form, then I like my argument goes out the window. But that sentence, I would argue, is just nearly undeniable proof that that being is having a subjective experience because they're literally telling you about it. It's not just, oh, they reacted to pain or noxious stimuli. Because, again, just about every life form does that, even ones without a CNS. Yeah, sure. 
I mean, I just, I don't know. I consider that compatible with my view, I suppose. Okay. That well, sounds like um, different personal requirements or perceived requirements. Yeah, or... I don't like to use the word requirement because then it sounds like we're saying it's logically entailed and I don't take that position, right? Like, I'm totally open to the fact that, you know, we could potentially create for example, like a sentient AI or that, you know, maybe, you know, we'd eventually discover some aliens that like possess sentience, but like lack all of the properties that we understand to give rise to sentience. And so that's, that's why I'm definitely agnostic on that. But like from our current level of understanding, it seems that these are the properties that give rise to sentience. Mm. Right, I, I just think it's um, too general to be a very strong argument, and uh, the emergent properties I've listed are a stronger argument for whether something is sentient than just the existence of a brain and being us within a being. Even if that's true, like I, sure, like I yeah. mean, I could I could accept that as being true, and and then I could still hold my view, right? Because just because there's a better inference that can be a stronger inference that can be made in the case of having more complex um, more complex information to uh, to a say in order to determine sentience I don't think that that means that for example like when we're less sure of sentience but we have a lot of evidence that there seems to be sentience that it would be enough to push that off if that makes sense, or to to well, just stimuli. Yeah. What? Sorry. What were you saying? I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I so, just... like, I can I can accept your position. Uh, see how? Yeah. Go ahead. I don't see how a reaction to not just stimuli and just the general existence of a brain and CNS means sentience. Like, I, I don't see how that even remotely strong because if you can't point to any specifics about the brain or the cns or its order or its makeup well i mean you can't do that with humans that either <laughs> right well you can look at um higher brain capacity in the humans that allow for self-reflection and yada yada but like, I, I don't know, like reaction to noxious stimuli or good stimuli or becoming depressed. None of those require a reflective mind or a subjective experience to exist. But I would argue that human language and art absolutely require a reflective mind to create, learn, use. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm not convinced of that, you know, but... Um... Yeah, I mean, I'm open to being convinced. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I think if 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 we if we boil it down, like we have different epistemic standards, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you're right, right. you're setting the bar for yeah. sentience higher than I am, right? <laughs> Yeah. Can you convince me to lower the bar? Because, I mean, what's your response to, like, the reaction to stimuli doesn't mean sentience? Like, why should I believe well, I agree that, with that in combination with... Oh, go ahead. Why should I believe that that in combination with a brain and CNS probably... Um, gives rise to sentience when they lack so many um, emergent properties of that sentience. Like, why should I believe? Uh, why should I even lean towards? Oh, it has a brain and a CNS, and if it steps on an owl, it reacts. Sure. So why should I believe or lean towards that? Being like, okay, it's probably subjectively experiencing this moment in time and mm -hmm. reflecting or thinking about it in some 
way. Now, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that there needs to be a reflection in order for sentience to occur, right? Because, like, it, let's say there's a being, and all it experiences is seeing a pinprick of light, and that's it. Like, that's its entire experience, is just seeing a pinprick of light. Like, as long as that experience is occurring, that's a subjective experience, and therefore, that would equal sentience. Alright, but if it can't even... If it can't even reflect on that stimuli that's happening somewhere within its nervous system, most likely, right? Uh, then I don't see how sentence sentience could develop. Like, what? Uh, what has? What has? Just the lack of reflection completely. Sure, I don't see. Do you think that something without any reflective abilities at all can be conscious? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually surprised that you don't. Well, I can't even know that it's experiencing it. What do you mean, know that it's it experiencing it? It can't even know it. that it's happening. Well, I, I, well, what would that mind be like? I don't think that there's a mind there if there's no reflection happening at all. Oh, well, that's that's very interesting. I, def I definitely don't take that position. So I'm asking you, like... Yeah. What do you think? Let's see. I, I mean, okay, this is a decent example. I guess. Do you believe that while you're sleeping, if you have a dream, but you literally don't have a... Well, I, ju I just don't understand how you think the senti sentient experience could happen without any output after it's been experienced. Like, are you arguing that these things have emotions? I mean, what is even a, an emotion or a feeling without an awareness I mean, I just... Of it. I just... Mind. I mean, I understand emotions to be something that can arise from sentience, but I don't understand emotions to be required for sentience. But that being said, I mean, like, I do have a uh, strong doxastic leaning that, for example, domesticated farmed animals feel emotions, and there's there's just a wealth of evidence on that. I can actually send you some studies if you're interested. Well, no, you can show that they can have emotional states which is a biological, psychological, neurological thing. Well, if it's... But you, you, can't, you can't show evidence that they're feeling that emotional state. Those are very different things. Yeah, but you can't show evidence of that for a human either. I would argue that a... It, the bar for proof of sentience is a... It's pretty much human, a basic sentence, like I said earlier. Well, like, if a being tells you, yesterday I felt like this, so today I want to do this, so tomorrow I might feel like this, or even something more basic, then if you still think that they aren't sentient, then you're just arguing in bad faith. Would you argue that a being that can speak like that and actually tell you about a subjective experience going on? might not be sentient, I don't see how that could be possible. Well, possible on a logical modality? Possible. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, but, I mean... I'm asking you why... If... If a being communicates their subjective experience to you, which doesn't require a lot, requires a basic human language sentence, then would you still have a doubt that they're sentient when they're literally telling you about their sentience? I mean, in most cases, no. But 
that doesn't mean that I think that it's impossible logically for that to occur, right? I don't see any contradiction but uh, like with the existence of for example a philosophical zombie, right? Like that's I, I it's it seems perfectly logically coherent to me. I mean, if you think there's a contradiction there, I, I, you know, I'd definitely be interested in, in seeing the derivation of that. Right. So, uh, language is literally a reflective emergent property of subjective experience, and if you're going to argue that something can have that and not be sentient I would definitely need an, an example where you're just reaching for other worldly outliers that you can't substantiate well I mean it, they can in the sense that it's logically possible right like there's no contradiction between those two propositions saying this being expresses words in language and and expresses um, experience it's, uh, expresses what appear to be subjective experiences yet this being is not sentient like if the, if you think that's a contradiction then like just definitely I would love to see the contradiction like please derive it for me I think it's most likely a contradiction because I mean you said it yourself it's expressing what appears to be a conscious experience sure with words sure but let's say that that occurs and the the other proposition in conjunction is that the being is not sentient like i don't see where the logical contradiction so is could you like lay it out for me give me an, ex an example of what an example of something that can speak a language which requires reflection of time do you, emotion self do you know self and it's not sentient. Do you know what a philosophical zombie is? Well, is that a real thing? I'm asking you for an example because I don't believe that that could ever occur. Like it's and yeah. so I have like a base belief shows sentience. Yeah, so like if you, you have sort of a ballpark, I guess. Yeah, like well, if you believe that it can't occur, right? You, you, then I'm assuming you're saying that it's logically impossible for that to happen, and so then. I would just ask you, what's the contradiction? I'm, you don't have to formalize it. But if, yeah, you don't have to formalize it, but if you could just spell it out for me, I'd really appreciate that. I believe I already did, because... Oh, I, I must have missed that. Could you do it nature. one more time? Well, it's an abstraction of a conscious experience. And then, like, if... And there's a lot of logically possible things that are just so absurdly out of this world that it almost seems like shifting goalposts. Like, if I said a human genome is the trait that I care about, yeah, and you said, well, there's an alien race that has a genome almost or completely identical to humans, but they look 100% and act 100% different, th there's no basis in reality for that logical possibility. Uh... There's, there's just n nothing. I, yeah, I don't really understand what you're saying there. Like, logical possibility doesn't require something to be I existing in the real world, right? Like, I can, I can come up with a hypothetical, and it, as long as there's no contradiction entailed in my hypothetical, then it's logically coherent. There's no, there's, it's, it's logically possible, right? I think that the use of language to, for example, describe one's needs requires a reflective mind because language is literally a... It's literally just the emergent structure of a subjective experience because it's based on the subjective experience of different real-world concepts. And so... Uh, I have absolutely no reason to believe that the use of human language and the reference to self and 
all the other crazy things that go on within human language, the things that we do every second within our minds is absolutely just... It, it's insane. I mean, we continuously reference our experience in the past with our present experience and the future experience. I have no reason to believe that language describing those things and showing awareness of self, time, emotions, all these things isn't a really good fucking proof for sentience. Mm. Like, I have no reason to believe that they could use that language or create that language or make art that is similar in components to that language and then not be sentient. It, it almost... Like, there almost is a logical disconnection there. I, I don't know what a logical disconnection is. Are you saying there's a logical contradiction? Well, I'm, I'm saying... Or so, some other like, some other problem in logic, maybe? I don't know. Oh, yeah. The nature of human language. Like, it just shows an awareness. That's what it represents. It's a reflection of that subjective experience. Which has awareness in it. Do you not believe that any awareness is required for a subjective experience? Yeah, awareness is what is a synonym for a subjective experience, right? Like, if you're aware of something, I don't take that to. If you're aware of something, I don't take that. To, oh, sorry, were you talking? No, go ahead. Sorry. Oh well, if if you're aware of something occurring then to me that's the same as having sentience however i don't take awareness to be a like a how do i put this i don't think that you i don't think that you need to be aware of something in order to uh i don't think that uh, logically that you need to be aware of something in order for um there to be a reflection occur like i don't think that a reflect Sorry, I just stumbled over my words. I don't think that a reflection is required for awareness, if that makes sense. Okay, well, I think the reflection is a result of awareness. Like, what do we get out of awareness? Like, we get well, a comparison between what we're currently aware of and what we were of in the past, and depending on intellectual aptitude that results in awareness of other things, like time, because we're comparing instances of awareness over time. Yeah, but being aware of... And oh, go ahead. So I believe that reflection is pretty much the result of awareness. Because otherwise, I mean, if something has absolutely zero capacity for reflecting on its memory within its awareness. And as you mentioned earlier, just like sees a small yellow light. Sure, yeah. But it's not. It can't even, like, reflect that it's doing this. Yeah. Or, like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to. Like, I don't, I don't see why it would have to, logically. Well, because there's no... Well, like, when I, if I were to see a yellow light, I would be aware of its color, which requires an awareness of other colors. I would be aware of its warmth, if it has warmth. Uh, I'm which not... an awareness of different senses and a comparison between things. And then the awareness of past and present and future would arise out of the awareness of those multiple sensations over time. I don't think that something can be aware without any reflective capabilities whatsoever. So, okay, so, yeah, my, my same question. I mean, like, if something cannot be aware of something without reflection, then, like, what's the contradiction between there being a being that is aware of something yet is not reflecting? And actually, I've been meaning to ask you this. Do you know what a logical contradiction is? Well, I mean, I mean, I have an educated way of saying it that you would prefer, but it would 
be a contradiction within the rules of logic that basically break down the logical structure of something and make it it's like a value statement right it either is or isn't um logically consistent right right consistency yeah uh, so essentially like what i'm saying is that oh, oh, well, i'll just explain plainly what a logical contradiction is like when i would like for the example i gave earlier if i'm standing inside and i'm standing outside at the same time like that's a logical contradiction because i can i can show the entailment of any uh, of a certain proposition represented as p in conjunction with its negation not p so for example i could say that i am standing inside and i am not standing inside because i affirm that i'm standing outside right so those yeah. those two propositions together entail a logical contradiction because i can i can inf i can logically infer p and not p valid validly uh, from those two propositions right so when i ask you like what's the logical contradiction between uh like a being having awareness yet not reflecting on said awareness then I'm, I'm asking like what proposition and its negation are affirmed by those two propositions being true okay um well i think that the um contradiction there then would be that what what even is an awareness of something without reflective capabilities that that just doesn't work in my in my mind like i mean i take awareness it, if it can't even, yeah if it can't hold a thought in its head about the awareness if it can't hold a thought in its head at all in any form with any number of connections made between other experiences yeah about what it is experiencing as a being well i'm not saying that it can't but i'm just saying that it's not right <laughs> okay so now you're gonna argue that your hypothetical being maybe can reflect uh, is that what you're saying no i'm saying it, it does not reflect there's no reflection whatsoever i'm just saying it's not logically impossible for a being to be aware and to because if i say that it, a being cannot you know, then I'm saying that it's logically impossible. If I say that it can, I'm probably saying that it will, I, I will be saying in this instance, I'm saying that it's logically possible, right? So like, I don't see a contradiction between a being being aware and reflective, but I also don't see a contradiction between a being being aware and not reflective. I mean, I don't think thoughts can occur without reflection on any level. Uh, would you argue that no, for um I think I could get subjective on board. experience. I think I could get on board with that. And then if you can't have thoughts which the thought oh shit that hurts or something. Mm -hmm. That's just that's the experience of that stimuli. Uh, no, I, I don't take thoughts to be the, synonymous with experience, do you? Well, I believe if you don't have any thoughts at all, then how are you sentient? Because like you're you having a subjective experience. Like, why would I need to think something? Logically, why would it be entailed that I would have to think something in order to experience it? Well, I think that don't necessarily mean internal monologue or something. But I mean, if you were to scrape your knee and then have the notion within your mind or the sensation which I, would consider, I, I would consider that to be a thought if you don't have that then well i mean let's say what, you're doing without experience of it or awareness well let's say like let's say for example i have a being that only experiences pain like it has the sensation of pain and that's it right like there's no there's no there's no thoughts that go along with that there's no reflection it's just pain that is being experienced this the the literal sensation of pain right i don't see why there there would be logically why there would need to be a logically in, or 
need meaning logically. I would that there would be a logically entailed um, that, that 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 would be logically entailed from that. So if something, first of all, if something feels something, that implies the presence of a mind, right? Because otherwise, it's just biological responses to a negative stimuli yeah totally which again so if it doesn't have thoughts or reflection in any capacity mm -hmm. sure. then I think you basically said if it doesn't have a mind that doesn't mean it's not experiencing the things going on yeah I mean and I think it's necessary yeah I don't I don't think that one requires um, logically a mind or I like it depends on like what you're saying a mind is, right? But like if a mind is that which um, re that which receives the the sensation or the the stimuli of whatever kind, right? Then I like I yeah. don't see why you would need to be reflective in that, right? Maybe you're defining mind d differently. I mean, those are aspects of a mind, like reflective capabilities which I wouldn't even argue is one singular trait because it is and it isn't but it covers a wide range of things like what are you aware and thus reflective of yourself time the experience of emotions the feeling of physical stimuli um, so yeah I think we're probably just going to disagree on whether or not a mind is required for subjective experience? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true, but I think we might be defining mind differently. Like, like that's why I was asking you, like, how do you define a mind? Like, what is what is the, the definition of a mind on your view? It is the... It's the subjective experience and it's the structure of capabilities or it's the capabilities that it's a thing that arises from the capability to experience things. And like I, I think that reflection on some level, and thus awareness of something, like of self, past, present, something, right, is necessary for a mind to be there. Because if a mind doesn't have any reflection at all, and no self-awareness, and no thoughts even, which you said, yeah, thoughts might not be even necessary then I don't think you could define that as a mind. Yeah. On, because a mind... I, I, yeah. I would agree. I would agree. On your definition, that would definitely be true. But we like like we definitely do have different definitions of a mind, and I think that's where the discrepancy lies. Like, if we're using your definition of a mind, then, like, yeah, I'm on board with that. Mm -hmm. Like, when we... Okay, what's your... Essentially, when we say mind, we're, your... we're just talking about two completely different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's um, your definition of mind? Uh, it's that which receives um, an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty good. But, I mean, if that's a, I, I, I would just say that, that you're literally defining mind as a central nervous system because wait how is that entailed because if it's literally just something that's receiving experience which by the way i think that we're just going to end up like running in a circle because experience implies a mind it, then if you're just arguing that it's because a, a central nervous system r responds to stimuli. Yeah. And so if that's your bare bones definition of a mind, well, then anything with a central nervous system would just definitely be experiencing the stimuli. 
Which I don't think is evident. No. And you would have to, like, I don't make think, an argument. I don't think that's an accurate representation of my view. I mean... Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, like, what I'm essentially saying is that a mind is that which receives an experience. A, a central nervous system reacting to stimuli is not the same as receiving an experience, right? Like, receiving an experience is the awareness itself. It's it's the... It's that reception of the experience. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. So an awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what do we get out of awareness? We get... If we don't have any reflective capabilities at all, i.e. Then it would just be awareness. I, but without memory or comparison. Sure. Or thoughts the awareness. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, I just don't think that that properly. I, I just don't think there's much basis to that. That there could be a mind without those, any of those traits, even thoughts. Just personally, so. You you think that can't that can't occur? Mm. No, not really. I would imagine it would be like being under anesthesia. I mean, you're not really having thoughts or reflection. Sure, but you're not having experience either. Well, you could argue that you're having some sort of experience on some level, but there's no identifying factors, <laughs> like awareness. I mean, I'm just not convinced is... of that. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, that's fine. Um, I don't think your position is bad or anything. I mean, sure. I would say, I would say there is definitely logic to be found in the statement of oh if something has a brain and a central nervous system then it could be experiencing but I just don't think it's likely so I mean that was a good argument yeah I mean it would be interesting if we you know perhaps we could look into this um, a little more empirically and then maybe visit this discussion again um, and look at some of the empirics I think that might be interesting yeah I think so um I'll look up some... I'm not working right now because of my shoulder, so... I can look up, see what I find, share it with you, vice versa. Yeah, Same. that'd be cool. Alrighty. Cool, cool, man. Right on. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about in particular, or...? Um... Nutrition sounded fun, I think, of... How long has it been? Uh, uh, a couple know. hours ago. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about it at a later date. Sure, yeah. I would uh, I would definitely enjoy conversating again um, whenever you're free or whatever. Great. Have a nice night, man. Yeah, you too. Take care.